Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Tonight, I have that uh, usual privilege the DWTN grants to me to come into your homes to help you hear the stories of men and women who, uh, in their love for our Lord Jesus, a desire to follow God's call in their life, to be obedient to our Lord, to be faithful to His call to love, that in that process, their hearts and minds get moved, get changed, and many softened, if you, if you will, to the fullness of the church in a way maybe they never were before. And in that process, they discover the fullness and the beauty of the church. And so they're here to tell their story. Uh, we'll find out in a moment I, as, as I also hear the story of our tonight's guest, Dr. James Papandrea. Uh, he's a professor, but he's, uh, for the context of our pro program, he's a former United Methodist. So Jim, welcome to The Journey Hall. Thank you, Marcus, thank you, it's good to be here. It's good to have you here. Before I even uh, start the journey, I want the folk to know that you have a website, www.jimpapandrea, mm -hmm. P-A-P-A-N-D-R-E-A.com. Right. The reason I mentioned that out front, you've got a number of books. Mm -hmm. People can find out the, the bigger details that we can't cover in, in the short time we have here, right? Yeah. And so, again, I thank you for the journey. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but usually the first thing I do on the journey home is get out of the way as soon as I can. And <laughs> I help. did know that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. encourage you to go way back to yeah. the beginning of, yeah. of your own spiritual journey and help us know where you've come from. Well, um, as I said, thanks. It's great to be here. I, uh, I, I feel like I just got back from Rome, actually, and, and I feel like I'm there again with the, uh, <laughs> yes. with, with the windows here. But um, no, don't. The audience really believes that we're in an apartment. Ah, okay. Yeah, in Rome, overlooking right. uh, the Tiber the River. Monte San Angelo there. Yes, right over right. there, yeah. and, and out of this. I mean, imagine to have an apartment where the, the window yeah. is overlooking the Vatican like that. It took yeah. us a long time to it's get very this nice. special it's spot. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, you know, going back to the beginning, I'm not sure if I count as a convert or a revert because uh, I was baptized in the church. Um, being Italian, my father's family is uh, Roman Catholic, going back uh, till forever. And so um, when, uh, when my, my brother and I were born, we were baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I was baptized at St. Lambert's in Skokie, Illinois. So hello, St. Lambert's. Um, <laughs> But uh, my mother was Protestant, and so, uh, in fact, I was, I was born in 1963, so uh, the oh. Vatican II and I turned uh, 50 this year. It's, uh, it's a big one for me. But um, when, uh, when we were very little, we actually lived uh, in, on an army base for a while, Fort Dix, New Jersey. This was during the Vietnam War, actually. And uh, after my dad got out of the service, he was an army dentist. Um, after he got out of the service, he, uh, my parents moved us to Wisconsin, and there we ended up uh, finding a Lutheran church. And I think that, um, as I ask my parents about it now, I think it seemed like maybe a happy medium. Sure. Um, and uh, so uh, I was confirmed, raised and confirmed in the Lutheran church. And, and I, I have to always be um, grateful to the Lutherans for a couple of things. The gifts that they gave me, I think, were... Um, number one, an appreciation for liturgy. Now, you know, the time that I was in the Catholic Church, I wasn't old enough to understand what liturgy was. But um, as I grew up in the Lutheran Church, I got to to um, appreciate liturgy. And, and actually, as it turns out, it's you know the, those aspects of liturgy that come from the Catholic Church anyway. But you know, the right. scripture readings and things. But and also the singing. I mean, the the um, the Lutherans gave me a real appreciation for singing, and not just singing, but singing theology. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, the old hymns, whether they're Lutheran or Catholic or whatever, the old hymns uh, seem to have a lot more theology in them. And I think I learned my theology, and I learned about the Trinity from singing hymns and from paying attention to the lyrics of the hymns. And the singing of hymns in the Lutheran liturgy is very central to it. Very, mm -hmm. I mean, you're really called to sing. You're proclaiming. Right. It's, as I look back at my own Lutheran upbringing, it was parallel to proclaiming the creed mm -hmm. and singing that hymn. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, in the Lutheran church, we had the creeds as well. And so, um, so you know, I think that I felt connected to that, but didn't feel connected to the church community that much. Mm -hmm. 
um, through no fault of their own probably, but as a youth, you know, I didn't feel like there was anything drawing me or connecting me. And, and uh, when we were confirmed, we were told that, you know, you were now spiritually adults, able to make your own decisions. <laughs> and so I left, you know, and um, now thankfully I didn't, didn't feel like I didn't need God. I didn't even feel like I didn't need religion. I knew that I wanted to be a part of something, um, but I didn't feel connected there. And was, it, uh, was your spirituality a part of your private life? Well, Prayer, it, scripture? it came to be because um, we had uh, we had a neighbor, next door neighbor, when I was a kid, who would invite us to Bible studies in their homes, and uh, they were evangelical, and. The, uh, through the context of those Bible studies, I had, as a you know, early preteen, um, come to a point where you know, I was ready to make a commitment to Jesus Christ for my life. And, and um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with sort of the yeah. evangelical um, presentation of the gospel in which you know, it, it, it sort of leads up to uh, a commitment, mm -hmm. praying a certain prayer or um, you know, making some sort of uh, commitment of, of turning one's life over to Jesus Christ. And, and so um, I did come to the point where I was ready to do that. And, um, and so I felt like I had accepted Jesus Christ as my savior. I'd committed my life to him, but you know, I was pretty young, so I didn't really know what that meant or, or, or how I would live that. Um, so as, uh, as I got into high school, that sort of faded into the background more and uh, knew some some folks in a Methodist church, had a girlfriend in the Methodist church, and started going to the Methodist youth group. I'm and, going to interject yeah, one other yeah. thing here, that you, you have a little album here called Still Quiet Voice right. of music you wrote. I'm wondering, as you set the church aside, did music become a big part of your life? It did. Actually, this is about at the time when um, I was starting to write my own songs. Uh, got a guitar for Christmas one year and um, <laughs> found it easier to write my own songs than learn other people's songs. Now, you know, my advice to young musicians out there is <laughs> learn other people's songs. Uh, but I took the shortcut and so I wrote my own songs. But um, I did start writing songs that expressed not only my faith, but other other parts of what I was going through. And of course, you know, the classic um, mistake that all young songwriters make is that they set their diary to music. So uh, <laughs> it becomes a little too personal sometimes. But, uh, but I did get involved in the Methodist Church and, you know, the, w one of the gifts that they gave me early on was this idea of participation, um, allowing people to participate. And so even as a brand new songwriter, I was allowed to sing my songs in church and, you know, lead the youth group singing by playing the guitar and some of these things. And so the idea of leadership in a faith community all of a sudden became a possibility. And I even got a chance to, you know, teach a couple of Bible studies or youth group meetings, you know, in that sense. So, uh, so, so that was good. The, the United Methodist Church is, um, you know, as you know, a denomination that sprang out of the Anglican Church. And then the American uh, wing of it is, is referred to as United Methodist, but there's a whole sort of um, greater Methodist world out there. And um, one of the interesting things about the Methodist Church that actually attracted me early on was that they... Uh, they were sort of intentionally non-creedal. Now, they would, back in the day, they would say they were non-creedal, although I think that's kind of a misnomer because the creeds have always been in the hymnals. I think they're more creed optional. Um, as a youth and a young adult, I found that attractive because it was sort of presented to me as though you can believe anything you want and you're welcome here. And you can, you can understand the, the um, attraction of that kind of thinking, you know. You can basically believe anything you want and be welcome here. And so that gave me kind of license to be, um, you know, how they like to say now, spiritual but not religious, uh -huh. you know. Um, I can have a faith in my heart but not necessarily follow all the rules, not necessarily live according to the moral expectations of the faith, etc. So, um, 
so I, so I ended up sticking with the United Methodist Church, ended up joining that, that denomination. And, um, and then, you know, really started coming more into my faith in college. I um, got hooked up with an outfit called Campus Crusade for Christ. Right. I'm sure you've heard of them. Of course. And God bless them. You know, they, they gave me some real gifts too, you know. Yeah. Um, Very much in line with the, you talked earlier about the evangelical call right. for it, leading up to conversion. I mean, that's what Campus Crusade is all about. In fact, it was a little bit like putting together all of the gifts I had gotten up until that point because I had the evangelical commitment, uh, the commitment to Scripture. I had the, um, the music because it was a youth-oriented uh, organization, and so there was a lot of music. And they gave me opportunities uh, for leadership. I got to lead a Bible study. I got to, you know, play the guitar to help lead worship. And so a lot of things were coming together in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, you know, um, I was really sort of thinking back on my faith. My, uh, my grandfather, my dad's father, was a, was a great influence uh, on my faith, even though maybe I didn't know it early on. Um, as I said, you know, his, uh, my dad's family was Catholic, and so uh, my grandfather was Roman Catholic. And he, um, in fact, many people in my family have a great devotion to uh, St. Padre Pio. Yeah. So, in fact, even while Padre Pio was alive, they would, uh, they, they had a devotion to him. And, and um, without going into too much detail, they, they really believed that his intercession had got them through, through some tough times. And so, um, he had, uh, my grandfather had made a commitment at a point in his life that he was not going to miss Mass. He was going to go every week. And he did. Uh, and, and in fact, even when we were, you know, on a fishing trip with him somewhere in the w northern woods of Wisconsin, he would find a place to go to Mass. <laughs> and, um, and that made a real impression on me. Um, so a lot of this stuff was coming together in my life. Uh, when I finished college, I went out to, moved out to L.A., and I wanted to get into the entertainment industry. I wanted to be a part of filmmaking, and, and I was especially interested in audio production. Being a musician, mm -hmm. I sort of knew my way around a mixing board, and I thought, you know, this is something <laughs> I could do. I had I'd done a lot of... Um, audio production and broadcasting in college, did the college radio station thing, and for a while even had a uh, Christian music show on the college radio station. But, um, but when I got out to L.A., I, uh, I spent about a year working in a job that was sort of the, the entry-level job. You know, here are the cans of film, go drive them over to Universal or Warner Brothers or whatever. So, so I was the driver. I was the delivery guy. The interesting thing about that, though, is that, that I had been put in a position where I got to see people doing all the things I thought I wanted to do. Mm. And as I saw others doing these things, I thought, you know, that's really not for me. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be creative and I, you know, I got to see a lot of people sitting in dark control rooms all day long, you know, and pushing buttons. And I thought, I don't know, this isn't for me. And, and I decided to go back to school. And I thought, well, you know, what more important subject is there to study than theology? I want to, I need to know more about God. And I have a personality that doesn't tolerate mystery very well. So I wanted to, you know, I wanted all the questions answered. I wanted all the mysteries solved. And I thought the best way to do that is to, is to go to seminary. So I started looking into seminaries and found that there was one very close to where I was living at the time. And... Um, didn't want to move again. So I thought, well, you know, seminary is seminary, right? They're all basically the same because they all study the same Bible. I mean, this is how naive I was. <laughs> um, but thank God, I mean, it must have been Providence because I ended up at a place called Fuller Seminary, Fuller Theological Seminary. Yeah. And again, you know, uh, this was another gift to me. And it was at Fuller that I really learned... Um, I, I learned a lot about theology. I learned a lot about doctrine. I learned a lot about, um, you know, the Bible. Uh, it's probably, well, first of all, for those yeah. of you just joining us, uh, our guest tonight is Dr. Uh, James Papandrea, former United Methodist. It might be good, Jim, 
to explain Fuller a little bit, because yeah. people may not know that, you say it's a real blessing. Well, it is a blessing for you as in, uh, then an mm -hmm. evangelical Protestant. Yeah. Talk about the beauty of Fuller. Well, Fuller is, a, is and was even then a very ecumenical place. Um, it's uh, it's a, basically a non-denominational or interdenominational uh, seminary, but mostly Protestant. Um, you know, I believe that probably most of the folks there come from a Reformed or Presbyterian mm -hmm. background. Um, so it was interesting because even as a Methodist, I was a bit of, a, of an anomaly there. Um, but uh, but it, it was just a very, uh, a very good scholarly academic place to be in the sense that, I mean, I will say, I will admit that it was at Fuller that I went from being a fundamentalist to an evangelical. And those are two different things, mm -hmm. as you know. And so, um, you know, so it was, a, it was a good three years that I spent there. Um, but then the problem is, you know, you, you finish with a Master's of Divinity degree. What do you do with it? Um, and it just seemed like the only option was to get ordained and become a pastor. So I went, Are you saying that you weren't sensing a clear call from God to do that, or this is more reasonable logic? This is I, what I should do. Yeah, that is that is definitely one way to say it. I mean, yeah. I would have, if you if you could go back in time and ask me then, I would probably say that God is leading me in this direction because I don't see any other options. But it, it was not that I felt called to um, ordained ministry per se. Now there are aspects of ordained ministry that I still feel are within my gift set. Yeah. Um, but then there are aspects of ordained ministry that are not. And, and what I came to find out was that this, this was not my calling. I mean, I did get ordained. I, um, I started out as, a, um, as, a, as an ordained deacon on track toward what they call elders orders, which is their you know, version of the senior minister. Right. Um, but I never got to that point. I, they, that's about the time when the denomination created a permanent deacon status. So I shifted to that and then was um, actually ordained again. I was ordained twice, which <laughs> I even knew at that time that was a little weird, but okay. Uh, so, but they said, just go with it because, you know, we're in this transitional period. So I got ordained as a deacon again. And, um, and then... Maybe they uh, didn't think it took the first time. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, but I mean, let's be fair. Ordination is not a sacrament yeah. in, in, that in, in, you know, uh, the Protestant denominations. And so it isn't exactly understood the same way. Um, although I think even they would say that, you know, normally you don't ordain somebody right. twice. You're either ordained or you're not. But, um, but I did, I got ordained again. And, and so I was a, a permanent deacon in, in the denomination. And served uh, for a couple years as an associate pastor and then for a couple years in, in what they call a three-point charge. Two churches of my own, two small country churches of my own, and then uh, uh, I was the youth director at a third church. But what I found out is that, you know, I was, I would spend my week working on my sermon. You know, Monday through Thursday, I was writing the sermon and crafting it. And it was a mini Bible study with all of the academic uh, research involved. And then on Friday afternoon, I'd be like, oh, no, I got to go visit somebody. You know, so it just <laughs> it wasn't in my nature to, uh, to yep. be pastoral. It was very difficult for me, in fact, to visit people in the hospital yeah. or people who were suffering and uh, found that that just that wasn't one of my gifts. And so, um, so I decided to go back to school again. And... Um, the uh, the folks in some of the folks in the denomination had given me a kind of a hard time for not having gone to a Methodist seminary to get my MDiv. So I thought, well, I better go to a Methodist seminary to get my PhD, and I ended up at Garrett Evangelical Seminary. And uh, you know, spoiler alert, I mean, that's where I ended up. That's where I'm still teaching now. Um, but I did. I went back to school, and I had decided I wanted to study the early church. I wanted to do a PhD in what we call patristics, the early church fathers. Was there a reason that you were finding yourself drawn that way? I mean, well, had you noticed I, a lack, or was this where your heart was? I had, you? um, I had really enjoyed church history in seminary, um, but I felt like I didn't get enough of the early church. 
And I also had this idea that, you know, again, kind of naive actually, that, you know, there was this golden age of Christianity where everything was perfect and everybody got along. And sure, they were persecuted, but, you know, um, that if we could just recapture that. And so I started studying the early church with that in mind. Of course, soon, um, you know, realized that that's not really the case. I mean, you know, there's, in fact, yeah. you know, the, the very fact that we have um, the ecumenical councils and some of the doctrines that we have are the result of a long struggle of debate and arguing and sometimes even controversy. So, but I really did fall in love with the early church. Can I also ask then, I hate to interrupt your flow, Jim, sorry, but uh, where has the Catholic Church been at all? I mean, you left it as a baby, mm -hmm. or really as a young man. Yeah. Uh, your attitudes towards the church, was there any inklings? Was there any connections during all this period leading up to your PhD studies? Yeah, well, that's a great question because um, because my father's family was Roman Catholic, I never had this sort of anti-Catholic bias that you know that some of our colleagues, uh, yeah. you know, had to overcome. Um, I always felt that that there was something to it, but as a Protestant, you know, the, the sort of general assumption is that that the church was going along fine, but that at some point it got off track, yeah. and the the, the the Protestant Reformation was an attempt to you know bring it back. Um, so even there for your desire to go back to the early church fathers was that very thing. Uh, at Getting the beginning. Back before. At the beginning. Before it went off, yeah. assuming there was this time when everything right. was just dandy. Exactly. And then whatever it was, exactly. they took it off track. In fact, the first time I went to Rome, my, my parents took us to Rome. Um, and uh, I remember, you know, early on, the first couple times going to Rome, going into the, the, um, the large basilicas and seeing, you know, the, um, the, the way that the architects had, you know, tried to reflect the grandeur of God in their architecture. But, you know, the, fir the first couple of times I, I went there, I think I had a, that very typical of Protestant responses mm -hmm. in that, um, you know, seeing it not as grandeur, but more as opulence and seeing it uh, through the eyes of Judas who said, you know, hey, this money could be better spent. We could have spent this money to feed the poor, you know. And of course, then you read the Bible and say, oh, that's, that's what Judas said. Um, so, you know, early on, I, but in spite of that, I, was, I really fell in love with Rome. And I fell in love with, you know, what I felt was the, you know, the, the presence of the church in Rome. So when I went back to do the PhD, not only was I reading the early church fathers, but I got a chance to go back to Rome and I got a chance to study there. I went to the American Academy in Rome and did, uh, they have a summer program and uh, lived in Rome for a summer and took this six week program. And that's where things started to fall into place. And that's where um, I really, really gained an appreciation for the Catholic church. Even though I had never been anti-Catholic, um, and I'd always had sort of a background appreciation for, for the Catholic Church. I had never really um, started to think that, that, well, wait a minute, maybe I'm missing something by not being a part of this. Um, maybe that's a good place to pause yeah, then. Sure. Why don't we take a, a break there? Because this is really where you're, you're on the cusp of maybe for the first time taking it a little more seriously. Okay, yeah. good. Right. Good, Jim. Uh, our guest tonight is Dr. Jim Papandrea, and we'll come back just a moment to hear the rest of his story. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host. And once again, our guest, 
Tonight is Dr. Jim Papandrea. He's former United Methodist. Uh, got a website, www.jimpapandrea.com. And just to let you know, his conversion story, the complete details uh, are on the website of the Coming Home Network, chnetwork.org.org. And uh, we actually featured your story in our July uh, 2013 newsletter. So it was yeah. connected with, our, yeah, with your, yeah. your broadcast here. So, so we, I, I've interrupted your journey oh. right when you're starting. I mean, can you look at a moment or a place or a time or a resource that the, the, the light started to come on? Well, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of things were coming together in my life. I was studying the church fathers, and so I was feeling drawn to the Catholic Church because as I saw it and as I see it, the Roman Catholic Church is uh, the one that is most consistent with um, you know, what was, uh, what was going on in the early church. Um, I mean, over time I came to a couple of conclusions and I, that I think really, um, really made me convinced that I, I, I had to make a move. Yeah. Um, but I, but I want to preface by saying that, that my conversion, if, if that's what it was, uh, back to the Roman Catholic Church, was at the same time a conviction that I was not, in fact, called to ordained ministry. And so, um, so I was also discerning giving up my status as an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church, which, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to give up something like that, even if you don't feel it's a perfect fit. So, um, so it was Cause, really Because part of it yeah. is, God, what do you call me to do? Right. I want to do what you want me to do, Lord. I may not like it. Right. Right. What I'm doing, but if that's what you want me to do, of course, I want to be faithful to you. I mean, so. Well, that's true. And of course, I thought I had an easy answer to that, which was that with my PhD, I would teach and I would teach church history. Um, but when I finished the PhD, I really, uh, there, there weren't any jobs forthcoming. And so I, you know, did some part time teaching, uh, but ended up having to take some temp jobs. A temp job turned into a permanent job in, in a cubicle in the marketing department of a major credit card, I won't say which one, but um, <laughs> really was not something that, you know, that was for me. And so, I mean, I, I, I spent five years praying every day, God, get me out of this cubicle. Um, and so, so this is what I was going through at the yeah. time. And, and as I was starting to say, I mean, I, I came to two conclusions throughout my study of the early church that, that, made, that convinced me that I had to make a move. Um, and you know when people ask me, you know what what uh, you know what what made you change, you know my my short answer is well I, you know I came to the conclusion that um, sola scriptura is false and the real presence of the Eucharist is true, and those are the those are the two conclusions. Now the first one you know sola scriptura it can be a bit of a caricature. I mean to be fair to the to the Protestants who who adhere to that. I mean I don't think any of them really say that they can't believe anything that's not in the Bible, right? Yeah. But, the, but the problem for me was is that if you, if you accept the idea of sola scriptura, scripture alone, that, that everything you need for the faith is, is in the Bible, you wouldn't have the Nicene Creed. And, and when I realized that, it was a major light bulb going on over my head. Um, because the Nicene Creed is the product of, you know, the early church struggling with how to interpret Scripture. And so, you know, with the Old Testament, we kind of have a nice summary of the Old Testament built right into the Old Testament, Ten Commandments. With the New Testament, you don't have a summary of the New Testament built into the New Testament. For that, you have to go to the Nicene Creed. And so I really came to believe in the importance of the creed for our understanding of the faith. And once you, once you accept that, you have to let go of sola scriptura because the creed is not in the Bible. And in fact, you know, one of the big controversies surrounding the creed, as you know, was the word that they finally used in the creed that's, that's not in scripture. And uh, of course, we all know what that word is, consubstantial, right? Uh, which is why I was so happy that I got to uh, recently got to write a book called Trinity 101, where I get to explain what the word consubstantial means. But um, 
Yeah, so I so I came to that conclusion. I also came to the other conclusion. Hold yeah. that one because I want to go on sure. that one. Sure. Because you have your book, Reading the Early Church Fathers, mm -hmm. here, which is, again, it's essentially your class. What you right. teach is this true. I mean, the Nicene Creed is established before the canon of Scripture. Well, is essentially declared by the bishops. I do deal with that in the book, in reading mm -hmm. the early church fathers. I have, there, I have a chapter on the development of the New Testament canon. And um, the New Testament canon, it's very interesting because what you have with the New Testament is not so much a definitive proclamation of here's the books that ought to be in the New Testament. It's more a growing consensus to the point where um, you could argue that the Nicene Creed is established before there is universal acceptance and agreement on every single book of the New Testament. But I wouldn't want to go so far as to say that, you know, the, the church didn't have a Bible until the fourth century. Right, so you wouldn't like say, that. and that's the, such yeah. a wonderful point, Jim. Yeah. It wasn't like all of a sudden at Rome and, or Carthage in, in 390, out of the blue, they, they declared these are the books given right. all these. No, no. Right. But it was the consensus of those texts that were being read in liturgy yeah. for 300 and some years. Right. Right. And what's also interesting is that when they do declare, they don't, they don't include in that canon this Nicene document, but they recognize its authority right. alongside the canon. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and of course, one of the, or, or the main criterion for inclusion in the New Testament is apostolic authorship. So everyone knew that the Nicene Creed wasn't written by the apostles, so of course it wouldn't be in the New Testament. But, as you say, it, 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 it is authoritative. It's considered authoritative. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, then the second thing that I, you said, and that was really... Yes, so I think where I was going with the yeah, other sorry, thing... I'm was, sorry. That's right, that's right. <laughs> it was um, on the Eucharist. I mean, yeah. you know, I, uh, I studied the early church fathers, and I read what they had to say about the Eucharist. And I realized that even though they didn't have the word transubstantiation yet, that all of them, from, from you know, Justin Martyr in the second century, Irenaeus, all of them um, understood something miraculous to be happening in the Eucharist. Specifically, the language that they used to describe what was happening in the Eucharist was language that was pulled right from the biblical accounts of the Incarnation. In other words, the word became flesh. Therefore, that becoming language was used to talk about the Eucharist. The bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, so there's this deep connection between the incarnation and the Eucharist. And it, I could go on and on. I have a whole lecture about this. But, um, but I, was, I really became convinced that, um, you know, that... that what the Roman Catholic Church teaches today about the Eucharist is the most consistent with what, you know, uh, what the early Christians were discerning about the Eucharist. And in your knowledge of the early Church Fathers on this issue, right up front, they're dealing with the very criticism to this day of the Eucharist, which is it doesn't look like or it doesn't taste like or it doesn't. They were saying, don't trust your senses. Mm, yeah. Right? They weren't it, saying that that isn't the criteria. Right. I mean, in a sense, what, what they're saying is that, that there's an aspect that's accessible to the senses and there's an aspect that's not accessible to the senses. And that's the reality. The one that's not accessible to the senses, the one that has to be seen with the eyes of faith, that's the, that's the true presence, that's the reality. So, um, yeah, so I mean, and, and I, I, I think I was ready to believe that anyway. It's not as though I had to be convinced to believe in the real presence. I was ready to believe it. I just wanted a good excuse to believe it. And, um, and, and actually, you know, in, it, it's interesting because in a lot of ways, United Methodist theology is not that far from Roman Catholic right. um, with regard to uh, an emphasis on free will and responsibility for human behavior and things like this. Holiness and sanctification. Exactly, that, yeah. exactly. Uh, on the Eucharist, however, it, that wouldn't be the case. But, um, but I, I, I really came to believe that I had sort of been Catholic all along and just didn't know it in a lot of ways. Um, now, you know, we all have those, those stumbling blocks 
at this point in the conversion story, right? And, and for me, the difficult part was um, the intercession of the saints and Mary. And um, because I had this idea that if you believe the saints can hear your prayers, you must be ascribing some sort of omniscience to them, which would be a form of idolatry. And that if you believe that the saints can do something for you, you must be ascribing some sort of omnipotence to them, which again would be a form of idolatry. So, so I had this sort of, I think, vague sense, which I believe many Protestants do, that, that prayer to the saints is a form of idolatry in yeah. some sense. And, um, and actually, I had a good friend who uh, sent me Scott Hahn's book, Rome, Rome Sweet Home, you know, and, uh, and who talked to me about this. And, I, and I, the answer I got made perfect sense, which, again, it was like I was ready to believe it. I just needed a reason to, to believe. And so, the, of course, the answer is, you know, we're, when we pray to the saints, we're not asking for their intervention. We're asking for their intercession. The way I might ask you to pray for me, um, I can ask someone who's, who's passed on with the Lord to pray for me. And it's, you know, prayer is asking. It's not, it's not worship in, in its essence, you know. So simply praying to the saints is not worshiping the saints. And so, you know, once I, was, once I saw that clearly, I was ready to, to you know, really move into the Catholic world. Um, but now, was this why you were still in your cubicle? <laughs> this was while I was still in my cubicle. And, um, and I had met my wife at that point. Um, we had gotten married. We, we eloped in Rome. And, um, and uh, we actually I had gone over with, with uh, my band. I had formed a music group called Remember Rome. And um, we had actually gone to Rome to play a concert over there. And so um, my uh, girlfriend at the time came along <laughs> and we eloped while we were there. And the next year we went back actually and um, I remember very vividly coming to a point when I really had to surrender everything to God. Um, because while I was happy with this new marriage, I was not content with where my career was. You know, I had a PhD, but wasn't teaching, except maybe part-time. Um, was, you know, working in a cubicle to pay the bills. And, um, you know, so having to do things that didn't, didn't fit my nature and that, you know, weren't part of my dreams and goals. And I remember being in Rome thinking, you know, that my greatest desire was to teach church history, to teach about Rome, to bring people to Rome and to show them and give them the kinds of experiences I was having there. And I had to say to myself, that may never happen. You know, that, that just may not happen. I, I may work a marketing job for the rest of my life. Um, and I had to just give that up. And I remember leaning on a, on a column, you know, I mean, there's you know, there's <laughs> columns everywhere. So I'm leaning on a 2,000-year-old column. And when I do that, I'm, I'm tactile, so I like to touch these things. And I, I always think, you know, maybe Peter or Paul leaned on this column, right? <laughs> maybe Augustine leaned on this column. But as I was touching it, I, I found myself praying, you know, uh, I, and I just had to give it up and say, if, if I never come back here, I have to just be thankful that I got here, you know, as many times as I had. And, um, and I gave it to God and I said, you know what, I want to do what you want me to do, even if that's not what I want to do. And, um, and I just really, you know, had to, had to come to that point of surrender. And within a year of that point, I was out of the cubicle. Um, and I was, uh, I had been offered, I, I had become Catholic and my wife and I had joined, um, a parish, and then the senior pastor, the pastor of the parish, came to me and asked me to join the staff full time. So fortunately for me, it was a large parish, large enough that they could afford to have a full time director of adult education, which is what I did. And I wow. did that. Um, I did that for four years. And um, I got the opportunity to write my first book at that point. Um, I, I wrote Spiritual Blueprint, which was. Um, kind of my, my manifesto almost in the sense that uh, it, was, it was sharing my experience of, of trying to organize my life 
um, around following the will of God. And um, because, I, as I said, you know, I, I was happy with my marriage, but I was unhappy with my job. Yeah. And I realized, you know, if if you're unhappy with one thing in your life, it can it can throw everything else out of whack, yeah. and you can feel like everything's going wrong when, in fact, that's not the case. And and I I kind of realized, you know, there are these five areas of life. You know, you've got your your relationships, job, church, home, and um, and the things that you do for you know hobbies, passions, and stuff. And um, and I started speaking about this. And I call them the five homes. These are your five homes. Home for your heart, your relationships, home for your mind, home for your body, home for your spirit, home for your hands. And a um, uh, publisher heard me speak and, and, and uh, they wanted me to write a book with them. This was, this was Ligori. And I ended up writing a spiritual blueprint for them. And, um, you know, it, it became this, this way of sharing what I had been through mm -hmm with other people and, and uh, sharing sort of how I organized my life so that I could make sense of it and not be upset about the parts that were, that were good, you know. Um, so I, uh, I ended up being on staff at that, uh, at that parish for four years. Um, also wrote my book on the book of Revelation at that time. So I was yeah. teaching, teaching scripture a lot. And, um, and then after that, I, uh, found out that a friend of mine who was the guy teaching church history at Garrett where I had gone where I'd done my PhD was was leaving Garrett to go to another institution and um, long story short I ended up getting his job and so <laughs> so now I am back at the United Methodist Seminary uh, and uh, I'm the the one Roman Catholic uh, on the faculty there um, but it's a very diverse, very ecumenical yeah. faculty. And I teach uh, early and medieval church history. Um, I was eventually able to write reading the early church fathers based on the, the classes that I teach. Because when I started learning about the church fathers in the early church, um, you know, professors would throw out these names like Ignatius, you know, hmm. and uh, Polycarp and Clement. And you know, there's two Ignatiuses and two Clements, and so that can get confusing. And so um, there was no really good, you know, book that, that laid it all out and explained it for the beginner. And so I decided that's what I would write. So reading the early church fathers is really for the beginner, studying the early church and reading the documents, the primary sources of the early church. All right. So I do that, and I get, to, uh, I get to do a course in Rome every year where I take students to Rome and... Um, we do. We we look at all the most ancient churches and sites, and we we really connect with early and medieval Christianity in Rome. And from that, I wrote uh, my latest book, which is a Pilgrim's Guide to the Eternal City. You know, got an email that touches on that last subject. Bill from Michigan writes, uh, and Dr. Papandreas travels to Italy. Did anything strike him in a different way after becoming Catholic? Yes, I think that's. Uh, it is fair to say that, you know, I quickly lost that sort of negative reaction that I had had at one time. And, you know, through studying, and not only studying the early church fathers, but studying art and architecture, I came to realize that, you know, just like what, you know, Mozart or Handel would try to do with music, yeah. or what Michelangelo or Botticelli would try to do with paintings, these architects, sometimes the same people, were trying to do that with architecture. And I came to realize that, that this was not um, opulence that I was seeing, but this was, this was an attempt to reflect uh, God as creator. And I really went from, you know, at one time having said, oh, you know, this money could have been better spent, to I need to be a part of this. <laughs> you know, this, this is bigger than anything I know of, and I need to be a part of this. And, and, you know, that was a big part of my conversion, I think, was, was coming to that point where, uh, because I, again, as I said, I'd never been anti-Catholic, but I had always sort of reserved the right to say, well, the Catholic Church is nice, but I don't need to be in it. I got to the point where I said, I need to be in it. I need to be a part of it. And, and I think it's wrapped up in that whole um, surrendering experience, because, you know, at some point you get to the, you get to a point in your life where you where you realize how
how important it is to belong to something greater than yourself. And it's too easy in, in some denominations and in, in some cultures like our own, it's too easy to fall into the trap of, of feeling that the freedom to choose is, is everything. Um, the problem with that is, is that if you push that to the extreme, you, you become your own God. You become your own highest authority. And you know what? I don't want that responsibility. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's too much pressure. I don't, I don't want to be my own God. I want to submit. I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. And for me, you know, that, that was the experience that I had. You know, I remember that very topic myself when I looked at the hugeness of, of things in the church and, and the amount of money that it took to, yeah. to do that. And I, I think I've come to see that over the years that the, the Catholic Church really has kept a good balance in that, both helping the poor as well as preserving these things. Because mm -hmm. on the one hand, one could say, well, if the money hadn't gone to build St. Peter's, it could have been distributed to help the poor. But those poor would have lived and died at that moment, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily have helped the poor today. So you can have the extreme of saying, you know, spending that money then only has an immediate impact. Uh, a longer impact is the great art. So you can you can go in either direction. But the church has always said it's a both and. It is. It is I, the I both firmly end. believe that. I mean, you know, we have um, in the Protestant world we have some denominations that are really good at the social justice, but not maybe not so good at the 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 faith of the heart or or the um, you know the the devotional aspect. We have other denominations that are really good at devotions, but you know can fall into the trap of using that as an excuse to be uh, sort of you know detached from the world. Yeah. And I really do believe the Catholic Church has that balance. Um, and you know, I, I told you I had a, a music group for a long time. I had this group called Remember Rome, and um, you know we we played everything from you know bars to coffee houses, played all the bookstores back when bookstores had stages in them. And, uh, but over time, you know, my music shifted from being sort of, you know, love songs and vaguely positive message to more overtly Christian. Um, but then eventually it, it, it became even, uh, I would say, overtly Catholic in the sense that, you know, I, uh, this latest CD that I just released has you know, a lot of Eucharistic themes in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, so even in my songwriting, that has been coming out almost in spite of myself. I mean, you know, in, uh, I found myself really um, thinking and writing about these kinds of themes that 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 are not just Christian, but more specifically yeah. Catholic. All right, Sam from Oklahoma writes: The early church fathers are so fascinating. What does Jim believe are a couple key elements in the church fathers' teachings that would be particularly relevant to someone considering becoming Catholic? Well, let's see, a couple of key elements. Well, I, I mentioned the, their, their thoughts on the Eucharist. And um, I really do believe that, that what the early church fathers were teaching, um, as, as much as they could understand it, was, is what we believe about the Eucharist. So that's really significant for me because, um, you know, you, you won't necessarily find that in, in very many other denominations. Um, some other things, I mean, I... I and for me, it's very important to focus on doctrine. Uh, when I teach church history, I'm very heavy on historical theology. So, for example, the, um, the, the discernment of doctrine that led up to the Nicene Creed is extremely important to me. And so um, the fact that we as Catholics say the Creed every week as a part of our Mass, I think that's, that's extremely significant. In fact, I'm even disappointed when we say the Apostles' Creed and not the Nicene Creed. I want to say consubstantial. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I think, I think those are a couple of things that come to what mind. What about also, and you're far more learned and studied in, in the early church father than I am. I wish I had the time to, and, and the ability to do that. But one thing that struck me also was it seemed that the earliest church fathers particularly recognized the continuity of the people of God all the way of Adam through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, one, mm -hmm. one stream. And it seems to me you see that because they're quoting the Old Testament right, right. Uh, for everything. 
they, they don't see that as an old book. This is the now. This is the right. And that was their Bible, um, especially you know the the earliest the earliest church writers um, quote the Old Testament more than they quote the New Testament because many of them are in conversation with Jewish believers or um, for those uh, you know if they're if they're in conversation with uh, pagans they're again showing that connection and showing how ancient this faith is this is not a brand new faith that we just came up with now this is connected back to the um, to the Old Testament and I would say also that the concept of apostolic succession became very important to me the idea that that what we believe has been taught down through the ages um, going back to the apostles and, and through them to Jesus himself that there's that continuity as well in the church what about the critique that come from some of our separate brethren that the absence of liturgy in the New Testament documents and in the actual writings of many of the early church fathers how do you address that question well, I would say that, that liturgy is not entirely absent in the New Testament. I mean, I think we have, um, we have snippets. We have quotations, uh, mostly probably in the letters of Paul, where he, uh, he has bits of creedal statements, bits of hymns. Um, I talk about that in, in Trinity 101 uh, quite a bit, actually. Um, uh, he, there are pieces in 1 Corinthians where he's quoting... What the what he's what he's received from the other apostles about the Eucharist and sort of the you know the the Last Supper uh, stuff and so so I think we do have that, um, but then also what you know by the middle of the second century, we have Justin Martyr's description of what right. happens in liturgy, which is you know very close to what we still do and so. That clearly was not new when yeah. Justin was writing it, and so uh, you know, the, the the liturgy develops very early. In fact, I think you can make the case that that uh, liturgy develops before doctrine. So that the fact that the early Christians were already worshiping Christ becomes the uh, the, the catalyst for them to have to explain why, you know, and and so of course the answer to that question is the doctrine of the Trinity, but. Um, but before they had an understanding, a full understanding of that, they knew it was, was right to worship Christ. And they were doing it by singing to him, uh, praying in his name, um, saying creeds, statements of faith that make him the object of faith, all of these things. And so, you know, that's, that's happening very early on. It's already happening even before Paul writes his letters. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. Colin from Maine writes, how do I respond to my Protestant friend who claims that Catholics and doctrines to the Bible uh, and believe in traditions that Jesus never intended? How do we respond? Catholics believe in, well, um, traditions and doctrines. Um, the doctrine is something that is... Uh, expands over time. When I say expands, I, I, that's maybe not be the, the best word, but um, every doctrine that we believe has its seeds in the New Testament. So it's already there. And, you know, we can show how, you know, every Catholic doctrine is, is present in Scripture, but, the, you know, you don't have a full understanding of it in the Scripture. So the understanding of it expands over time. Um, it, these doctrines become further clarified uh, so that what we now have as our doctrines, and again, I go through this a lot in my book, Trinity 101, because, you know, I show how the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, is, is in Scripture, but it had to be explained and clarified outside of Scripture. Um, so, so again, it's the balance thing, because on the one hand, it's, the doctrines are all there in Scripture, but on the other hand, you can't go so far as to say, well, sola scriptura, everything we need is there. We still needed to have the explanations and the clarifications come up over time. Um, you know, as far as the traditions, you know, there's, uh, there, there's tradition with a capital T and there are, there are traditions with a small t. And, um, you know, some of those things do change over time. And I mean, the very fact that we have mass in our own language now is, you know, is one well, of the things. Uh, well, one thing but, we do uh, know for sure when we read in the letters of Paul, particularly, is that 
there certainly seems to be a deposit of teaching that has been yes. passed on orally that he's presuming that he shares with the people he's writing yeah, absolutely, to. Absolutely, yeah. And the reason he's writing a letter is because there's a problem. Right. And that yeah. deposit ain't the problem, so he's not necessarily mentioning it. Right. And the Trinity could be one of those issues, as well as right. liturgy. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't the key issue. So. That's right. And, you, you know, that would be the reason why, you know, Jesus didn't talk about certain things, too. Just, it didn't come up. It wasn't an issue. Everybody agreed on it. So, you know. That's right. Or at least yeah. it isn't reported in, yeah. in the right. Gospels because right. it wasn't the issue. Dr. Papandrea. Jim, thank you very much for joining us My on pleasure. the Journey Thanks Home. I want to make me. sure to mention your name again so yeah. people can <laughs> catch that, your website, uh, to find out more what you're doing. Thank you very much for sharing your journey you. and, and uh, encourage your books for those that are uh, still on the journey Thanks. and want to understand more about the teaching of the church. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. God bless you. See you again next week. Mm -hmm.